Prepare yourself for Earthling Entertainment with your hosts, Joe and Ryan. Hello and welcome to another episode of Earthling Entertainment with Joe Wakefield and Ryan Lang. Hey, I'm Joe Wakefield. And I'm Ryan Lang. All right, guys. For those of us who are just visiting the show for the first time, visiting, <laughs> for listening to the show for the first time, what we do here is a little bit of the spooky, a little bit of the creepy. Sometimes we do cryptozoology, monsters. You know, we do hauntings. We do all kinds of fun stuff. And then followed by a lovely segment called Ryan's Disclosure Discussion. It's all about aliens and stuff. I'm just seeing, you know, what information's been released, what's been disclosed. Uh, Today, we're going to focus on uh, UFO sightings. Yeah, it's actually a big story day because spooky stuff, our first segment, is hauntings because we don't do a lot of hauntings. We've been stuck on monsters for a while. So we got six tales about hauntings, and then you have nine tales of alien abduction. Uh, uh, Just, yes, sightings. Sightings, alien sightings. All right, it's going to be perfect. Then the latter half of the show is dedicated to the entertainment industry. We have some movie news. We have a few celebrity deaths. And then at the end of the show, we're going to have a Fallout series. This is the television series from Amazon. Yep. All eight episodes, spoiler talk. And uh, so if you haven't seen Fallout yet and you don't want you know that spoiled, maybe skip that part. But that's going to be all the way to the end, so don't worry about it. And if you're like me and you don't mind, because I've only seen the first episode, uh, I'm I'm going to be going along for the ride with Joe on this one. I think it'll be fun because that's going to that's gonna add to the discussion, right? Because exactly. you're going to have questions. I'm going to fill them in as I see them. Because, you know, I am just a spectator on this. I, I played a few of the games, and I really like the show, and I, I feel like I have a very good grasp of everything I saw. But it's still just opinion. That's why right. we say this is a spoiler talk and not any kind of review. This is just our opinions. And, and I've uh, played a countless hours of Fallout 3, Fallout New Vegas, Fallout 4, so yeah, I, I, I'm pretty knowledgeable on, on the lore of it all. So that's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, so that's our show. And remember, guys, the best way to support us, if you like what you hear, is to download the episodes. Uh, yeah, please. That helps us out uh, for some reason or another. That's that's what we need. So, yeah, yeah give the, us a download. It used to be views or listens, excuse me, streams, and now it's it's purely downloads. Apparently, we're nothing without the downloads. Well, every Tuesday, every, just uh, we have a new episode. Please download it. And... Every week, and uh, yeah, enjoy. So, uh, concert season. You said you got a bunch of stuff coming up. I do. I got uh, concert tickets to Incubus with Coheed and Cambria. Oh, nice. That's going to be at Little Caesars Arena. Then I got tickets to Pine Knob, which is with Corn, Gojira, and Spirit Box is opening that one. Oh, man. Send me the link. I might want, I've never seen Corn. You know. Oh, they're so good. Yeah. And I've like, that was, Corn was the first CD I bought. I was in sixth grade. I bought Corn Freak on a Leash, and it, it had just come out. And that was like the first introduction to, I don't know, what would you call it? Like, the, it was an introduction to the metal gothic kind of music realm. It was that like new metal. Yeah. Well, it I, I dug it. You know what I mean? Oh, was, yeah. No, that <laughs> was. Still do. I ended up getting all the CDs from, do you remember the uh, the CD clubs? Oh, yeah. And uh, what's cool is I believe. I got all of them for 10 cents. <laughs> <laughs> I believe at, I think it's going to be August or September, somewhere around there, maybe even October is going to be the 30-year anniversary of Korn self-titled. Ooh. So that's a huge deal. Yes, that's the one of Blind, right? That's the first song, the yep. first track on that one. Yep. Oh, love that then. Like I said, CD Club totally screwed me, but got them all for 10 cents. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, it, uh, my, my old drummer still collects CDs. You should see it. It's crazy. Like, So some people still like them. Well, I like physical media, man. I have, uh, yeah. I have Blu-rays and Steelbooks and stuff like that. But in any case, I got a concert coming up, too. Uh, it's October, and it is Fawn. Yeah, you were telling me about that. Yeah, it's like uh, it's a folk, uh, pagan folk, European band. It's it's awesome, man. I don't know I, mean, I don't know how else to explain it. It's, if you know that kind of music, it's right up your alley. If you're a fan of, like, if you're, like, a guy or a gal who is super, in, or anyone in between, who is super into, like, Lord of the Rings and fantasy stuff, just imagine that. Band form. <laughs> Check them out. It's fun. Yeah, but no, the tickets were that much, I like man. that kind of stuff. I love like the pagan like folk music. It's like I like elf music. Their last CD, which just yeah. came out, is called Pagan. So yeah, 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 yeah. They have a song for for Halloween, and it's pretty cool. 
It's pretty I, cool. I like Halloween songs. I just, I'm expecting a, a certain group of people, right? Like, I want to be surprised, but are you not expecting, like, just, like, the whitest, like, weird goth people you've ever seen? A lot of Viking people. You I know. love that shit. All right, man. I wish, I don't know. You're going to see me many, back to the day. Many Thor's me hammers. When I spent a lot of time looking that way <laughs> yes well i still sort of do some days <laughs> it's true it's true i uh i gave up and i'm just t-shirt and jeans it's you know you can still see the gauges the in my ears cool. but i don't put them in <laughs> you're the classic cool joe the classic cool that's right all right that's any right. other concerts coming up uh i know the eclectic are going to be playing uh next weekend i believe in uh port huron right on right on they're they're a local band and uh they rock so what I'm excited for is Motor City Comic Con, man. I mean, there's just a ridiculous amount of celebrities this this year. And if you like getting your picture taken with celebrities or getting autographs, this is definitely a good time to go. I mean, Charlie Hunnam, Hunnam excuse me, you know him. He's from um, uh, Sons of Anarchy. Yeah, yeah, he was he was big in that. I know he he was in the King Arthur movie. Do you remember that one? I vaguely remember it. Well, you know, way, way, way back in the day, he was in an Elijah Wood movie, and it was uh, Green Street Hooligans. How about that one? I do remember that one. That one's fun. Uh, Helen Hunt, you know, from Twister? Yes. Yeah, she's going to be there. I, I I, I assume she has a new movie coming out, because I'm not entirely sure why she would be there otherwise. But Hayden Pantenter, you know who she is? The cheerleader from Heroes, man. Save that the cheerleader, save the world. That is the cheerleader. Yeah, well, she was in Scream 4, and she's also in uh, Scream 6. So oh, cool. since she's holding up a knife, and it, I, and it has the Scream mask in it in her picture, you assume that's what she's promoting. So one could also assume it has not been announced. This is not a scoop. But she's probably going to be in the next Scream, too, because her character, spoiler, lived. Oh, well, then there you go. Then probably. And uh, then, of course, you got uh, Katie Sackhoff, from, who was uh, Bo-Katan Kree's. Oh, yeah, in yeah. The Mandalorian. I really liked her as Bo-Katan. I think she did a great job. Because, you know, that Me character too. was first introduced in uh, Clone Wars. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, she did great. And then, of course, uh, she was Starbuck in the very popular reboot of Battlestar Galactica that came out in the early 2000s. So she has a lot of sci-fi under her belt. She does, because she also was in the last uh, Riddick movie. I knew I recognized her from something else. You're yeah, right. Yeah, she's been in a lot of stuff. She's really good. She is. Oh, and then after that, we have the legendary William Shatner. Ooh. Do I have to tell you? Do you? I have to tell you? Come on, William Shatner, obviously Captain Kirk, Captain uh, Kirk. and just sci-fi pop culture forever. And then just an actor. I think he was like, was it like BJ and the Bear or something? I don't know. There, he was no Hooker, something Hooker, TJ Hooker. That's what it was. It was a cop show. TJ Hooker. Priceline negotiator. <laughs> bit, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's William Shatner, man. You can't tell me you don't give a Shatner. Oh. oh. And then you got, uh, what's it, Karen Allen. Uh, you know what she is? I recognize her from Scrooged. Interesting. Yes, you're right. She is from Scrooge. But she's <laughs> uh, Indiana Jones. She was the love uh, interest yeah. in Raiders of the Lost Ark. She returned in Kingdom of the Crystal Skull and had a brief cameo in The Dial of Destiny. That's right, she did. Yes. So uh, Indiana Jones's love interest would be what I know her from. It's funny. You say Scrooged. Um, yes. That is not what I would have thought. I don't know. It looks like that's like when they took this picture. It like, looks that era. Like It looks just, I don't know. I don't know why. You're right. <laughs> that is weird that that's what popped in my head, but that is. I know. I love that movie. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> um, so a couple voice actors. Uh, this guy, I forget, is, is Greg Baldwin, I believe. I don't, I don't know. I don't uh, know anything about him. So what I know of him is I believe, and this is just going off his picture because the they don't have a little paragraph with there, but I think he was the voice actor who replaced uh, the guy who died. He was, uh, he replaced... He was a coup in the new in the as the villain in Samurai Jack. He played Uncle Iroh in the original Avatar. Once the original voice actor died, he replaced that voice actor in a lot of things after he died. Huh. And then we have uh, Dante Basco. Do you know who this is? Is that Rufio? Rufio! <laughs> it is Rufio. But he is also an accomplished actor and voice actor. He also was in Avatar. He played, uh, I believe, Zuko in the original Avatar. 
That's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, <laughs> Sophia Botella, I believe her name is. Do you know who she is? No. Okay, so she's the chick from the Kingsman who had the swords for the legs. She was also the mummy in the Tom Cruise mummy movie. Or is any of that ringing a bell? I didn't see either of those. Okay, she is in the new Rebel Moon with that Zack Snyder made. Oh, okay. Okay, well, long story short, she, she is a very amazing dancer. She's incredibly graceful. Huh. She was in Star Trek, the uh, the newest Star Trek with uh, Chris Pine. The one, she, you remember the alien who had a white face with black lines going down it? I think so, yeah. She was the main alien. She was kind of cool. She oh, rode the motorcycle. so she, in the third movie? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I loved those movies. Okay, well, that one is her. Okay. Yes. I, I know her work. Excellent. <laughs> Um, I don't know if we're going to go through all of these. We have Denise Crosby. The point is, there is a lot of actors. There's she, a lot. Of the... She's in Star Trek The Next Generation. We have Felicia Day, which, of course, is from The Guild and other sci-fi fun stuff. She was in Eureka. She did a, she did, uh, did a werewolf movie. She was in uh, Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog. Uh, so if you're a big fan of nerd stuff, Felicia Day, man. Then she you, wrote books. Then you got the voice of Master Chief. Uh, Steve Downs, which is cool, from the Halo series. Oh, yeah? And then, uh, of course, we got Moff Gideon is going to be there. Uh, I'm, I'm... You have to try these names, Ryan. <laughs> I'm going to... Uh, no, do it. Giancarlo Esposito. Yeah, that wasn't so bad, but the first the first name was bad. All right. <laughs> Steve Downs? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was right. Yeah. Ernie Hudson? Come on, guys. The guy from Ghostbusters, the guy who's in his 80s, but he looks like he's in his 50s. I was going to say he's going viral for like just being a hunk he's at also, his age. <laughs> yeah, and he was also with The Crow, the original Crow movie from yes. the 90s. It's Ernie freaking Hudson, And he played man. a cop in, what was was it, Airheads? I, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I have no memory of that. I don't know. Followed by Amy Jo Johnson, the original Pink Power Ranger, the woman I had a big old crush on. I have to admit, I'm going to get her autograph. I'm going to get her to sign the VHS of the Power Rangers movie. I just think it'd be fun. Uh, and then you got Simon uh, Kessianids, which uh, he was uh, Axe Wolves from Mandalorian. Mandalorian. Well. Was it just season three he was in? Uh, He was in, I think he was introduced in two. I want to say he was introduced in two because he came in with Bo-Katan. Oh, yeah. Well, that makes sense. And then, of course, Tom Kenny, which is uh, SpongeBob. SpongeBob. He did a bunch of other voices. But yes, absolutely. It was SpongeBob. Yeah. And he did like the French narrator. Anytime it's like three hours later, that's him. <laughs> three hours later. Which is a staple in my life. Whenever anything takes forever, I hear that voice. Oh, man. That is cool. Okay. So I'm going to kill, I'm going to destroy this name, but it's Paul Sunheing Lee. So he is in the Mandalorian as yeah. one of the pilots of the New Republic. But oh, he, his name's on the tip of my tongue. I don't know why I can't think of it. Of the character? Yeah. Yeah, but he also uh, starred in Kim's Convenience, which was a Canadian sitcom. It lasted, I believe, six seasons. You could see it on Netflix. It's great. Actually, his son in that is Simu Liu. So if you don't know who that is, that is uh, Song Chi from uh, the Marvel movie. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, dude, there's actually... A lot more, too. Ron Perlman is going to be there. Hellboy. Maybe. Yeah, Hellboy, the original Hellboy. Zachary Levi. Efren Ramirez. He's hilarious. Hold on. Zachary Levi, dude. That is that is uh, Shazam. Oh. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. He was, I mean, he was also in Chuck, the show, but yeah, he's a big deal. Oh, you're right. He is a big deal. Yeah. I didn't, I, I, I confess, I didn't recognize him. I was just like, handsome guy. I don't know. Gates McFadden's, <laughs> of course, from Star Trek The Next Generation. Very cool, very cool. A lot of wrestlers are going to be there. Oh, Jennifer Morrison, man. I love her. She was in the 19, uh, excuse me, the 2003 skateboarding film, Grind. I, yeah. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. She's I better, she's better known as the lead from Once Upon a Time, the uh, ABC show that lasted seven seasons. Yes, that, yes. that one's a little bit more well-known. Then, of course, you got uh, uh, Biff is going to be there, Tim Wilson. Tom, sorry, Tom Wilson. Oh, Katie Siegel, man. Katie Siegel is, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, Biff from Back to the Future, totally. Hell yeah. uh, Katie Siegel <laughs> is Leela from Futurama. No shit. Yeah. That's badass. Yeah, so that's fun. That would be fun to talk to her. Like, to just hear that voice in real life would be, I don't know, it'd be so trippy. 
Yeah, I agree. I I love it, and I love voice. Actors. There's a few we didn't talk about, but that is a lot. I was going to say we covered, I think, a lot of the the big ones there, and there's a ton more, you know. So that's great, and they say they're adding more. Of course. Well, I think they just keep trying to add some until you can't. So that's Motor City Comic Con, guys. If you are in Michigan or you want to travel to Michigan, that's May 17th through the 19th uh, this year. And it is in Novi, Michigan. Uh, you know, so check it out. And we'll be there. So if you see us, come say hi. Yeah. To be clear, we don't have a booth or anything. We're just going to be walking around. But yeah. if you happen to recognize us, hey, what's up? Yeah. Just what's up? <laughs> All right, guys, so we're going to jump into our first section, which is spooky stuff. Soden House in Los Angeles, California. After it was built in 1926 for photographer John Soden and his young family, the house enjoyed years of hosting bohemian parties for Hollywood's in crowd. Woo! But when (laughs) Dr. George Hodel moved into the house in 1945, it's late and as the potential crime scene... <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Sorry, it's fate. As the potential crime scene of America's most notorious cold case, the Black Dahlia. Cold case never solved. Though the murder of Elizabeth Short remains unsolved to this day... See, told you. By 1950, Dr. George Hodel became one of the prime suspects in her tragic case and many true crime buffs are convinced that he carried out the crime right inside this iconic Los Feliz mansion. Sounds like something they'd say on the ghost tour. It does. Yeah, right, right. That would sell tickets. (laughs) The, The home also went through a few stages of abandonment in the late 20th century, making it even more mysterious and spooky to passerby. That's our word. Spooky. According to Steve Hodell, former occupant, retired LAPD investigator, and son of Dr. Hodel. In case you needed more info about this guy. Like, he, he credible they, is what we're saying. Credible. Full scent. Several onlookers have noted its haunting trappings, according to Steve. In the 1970s, the Hodel housekeeper returned to the Soden house and informed the then current owner, this is a house of evil. Hold on. This is a house of evil. The you know, lady, I the thought lady that, from the Poltergeist. Yeah, exactly. I was gonna say that was Zelda from Poltergeist. Yes, totally. I I never knew her name. Thank you. <laughs> this house is clean, motherfucker. <laughs> motherfucker. And on another occasion, Edmund Tusk pointed to the house, saying, "It's an evil place. Artists, philosophers, accountants, and politicians all." At one plumber. And there. <laughs> Murders happen there. It's an evil place. Evil? Don't go in that house. Oh, you don't want to go down that road. During the same era, Dr. Hodel's daughter Tamar went inside the home and claimed to see the spirit of a young woman in the basement. Yeah, that's creepy. Yeah. Years later, in 2016, Ghost Adventures host Zach Baggins investigated the Soden house with Tamar's daughter, Fauna, who claimed to see the exact same spirit her mother did. It sucks they don't have it on film, because if they claim to see it, that means, like, they obviously didn't get the proof. That makes sense, though, right? Like, I imagine a lot of these ghost hunters would go on these adventures, and they would just, what if they experienced stuff? But it's like, no, we we did just, it didn't show up on film or a recording. There was a giant floating skull, and I, I, you know, got lifted off the ground and thrown 30 feet. It was straight out of Poltergeist. It looked like weird... See three three D puppets from Jim Henson that were see through with eighties of graphics, but nope, didn't get any of it. Nothing. Nope, no recording. Sorry. I mean that's a classic trope, right? You see like fucked up shit, and you're like, oh my god, and you go and you check the footage, and it's like nothing. I mean that would be almost more believable to me than just being like, look, check it out, and you hear static, and it's like, do you hear that? It said my grandma's name. I like spirit boxes, though. I would like to fuck around with one. I think they're interesting. Fair enough. All right, moving on. That that is our first chilling ghost story. Check out our chilling ghost story number two right now. Aman's house in Gary, Indiana. In 2011, Latoya Aman's moved into a small single-story home in Gary, Indiana, 
with her Gary, mother. Indiana. <laughs> with her mother and three young children. Only a few short months later, after reportedly experiencing the worst residential demon infestation since the Amityville horror. Oh yeah, you ain't gonna get those demons out of that wall. You gotta get you gotta get a bug bomb. Amans <laughs> brought her family to the emergency room in an attempt to help free them of demonic possession. Oh now I feel kinda bad. After extensive evaluations by police, members of the local church, hospital staff, and the Department of Child Protective Services, the witnesses were torn. Half of them believed the house was infested by spirits and demons, and that the family was genuinely possessed by something paranormal, while the other half blamed psychological issues. I mean, what? they're not mutually <laughs> exclusive. Just because you're crazy doesn't mean there's not a demon attacking you. I'm just saying. That's right. Just because I'm, I may, I may be paranoid. Don't but assume that doesn't people. mean someone's not following me. Exactly. Don't assume people. Just don't. God. <laughs> uh, so just like the best-selling book about the Amityville house turned into a national sensation, this modern instance of demonic possession to possession went viral. The what good, went viral? Did someone film it? I guess it was in 2011. All right. Uh, the good news is that the Amans family was able to find peace when they moved uh, to Indianapolis. Yeah, so they got out of Dodge. That's what I'm saying. There's so many of these movies. Like, I, If I'm with my family and there's a weird clock and I see like a child run across the room or like something and it laughs and it's like a shadowy thing, we're, lo- we're gone. We're moving. That's not act one. That's the end of the movie. We are moving. We are going into debt. <laughs> we don't need that. No, I'm just saying. Get a hotel, whatever. Burn it down. <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Just, you know, strike a match. Forget that. Definitely worse than finding a spider. All right, so the the Amon family got out of Dodge. All right, but there's clearly some people are split down the middle whether or not this house has demons in it. Right. Uh, Ghost Adventure host and paranormal investigator Zach Baggins brought the property. Uh, sorry, bought he bought the property from the Amon's landlord in 2014 to shoot pseudo documentary footage inside. Even though Baggins proceeded to tear it down. Wait, pseudo documentary footage? I guess. That wording makes it feel very, very unlegit, but continue. Yeah. The Amman's house is about to get even more press. Oscar nominee Lee Daniels is directing a film based on the story, The Deliverance. Okay, so that's why it's pseudo footage. They're probably going to use that footage. All right, continue. Oh, here you go. It's yeah. set to stream on Netflix in 2024 and will feature. Stranger Things star uh, Caleb McLaughlin. Oh, yeah, yeah, cool. That makes sense. Well, that's fun. That's uh, not fun. That's not fun? <laughs> Demonic possession is not fun. No, uh, I mean the movie part of it's fun. Right, remember, Earthling Entertainment. That's why this is relevant, because there's true. a movie. There's going to be a there's movie. There's a movie about this, all right? Yep, uh, The Deliverance, I guess. Yeah, and the kid from Stranger Things is going to be in it. Awesome. So, yes, so you know, good good for them. We got we got some good ghost stories out of their terror and horror and trauma. Well, Wonderful. if it's if it's about those kids, <laughs> I mean, if it's about that family, uh, you have to imagine they're getting some kind of money, man. They're getting it, they're getting paid at something. You know, they had to have. Otherwise, all the names have to be changed, and they might do that. They I don't might. know. Yeah, yeah, because it's just based on it, so it's not like a like. It says so. Yeah, it said pseudo. Well, but, like, which... well, I'm just saying based on means it could be, I mean, the, the, that is a wide spectrum of what that actually means, you know, where it's like this absolutely happened, but we dramatized a few of the scenes versus we made people up and put them in there for drama. Hollywood. <laughs> Hollywood. God, I love Hollywood. Ready? Anyways, here we go. Ghost story number three. Yeah, it is three, right? Yeah. Number three. The Kasha House. Of Kamuki in Honolulu, Hawaii. Ba, 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 ba. Hawaii haunting, which I don't know, seems fun. I mean, I don't know. Hawaii seems like it would be like his Hawaiian spirit, right? Like and I mean, some... you're pretty trapped. You're on an island. Yeah. I just feel, I always like the idea of that, like, all the old gods, like, exist in their countries of origin. Like, if you go to, you know, Norway or 
Finland or any of those countries, and I'm I'm if I'm wrong, I don't mean to misrepresent, but I'm just saying you have the Odin and Thor, and then you know if you go anywhere in the desert, you might have some of their old gods like Set and any yeah. of the Egyptian gods. I don't know. Yeah. I just I think it'd be really cool. Like you have to obey the gods of that land. Not saying that's a reality. I'm just saying, you know, awesome. That would make a cool video game. Like, the, you have to battle the gods, like, the different, and all of their different minions. And I think that's sections. God of War, to be clear. <laughs> oh, you're probably right. You're probably right. Anyways, Hawaii haunting. guy went off on a tangent. The Kasha House of Kaimuki in Honolulu, Hawaii, has been shrouded in mystery for decades. Shrouded. Its first bad press mention hit the Honolulu Star, just months after the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941. According to the article, police responded to a call from a woman shouting, she's trying to kill my children. She's trying to kill my children. Oh, that's, that's horrible. When they arrived, they found a young Hawaiian boy, his three sisters, and his mother all shrieking and being tossed around by nothing. Like they were just like floating in the air, getting like jerked around back and forth. That's some scary movie imagery. Yeah. Uh, about forget that last one. This should be in the movie. Yeah. About uh, thirty years later, other occupants reported similar attacks by an unseen force, which the responding officers corroborated. Okay, well that makes it more legit, right? If the cops like, no, no, we walked in and they were floating in the air and their eyes were going bloodshot and they were speaking in tongues. They're like, oh. Oh, just total oh. telekinesis slamming people against the wall. It's like, well, uh, Officer Jones, you have thoroughly made me poop my pants. I need to call my wife, and I'm quite embarrassed. So <laughs> please like, step out of my office so I can deal with this. <laughs> you pooped your pants, so you can go home. We all, Everybody understands. You don't even have to tell us. If you pooped your pants, you just go home. We'll all know what happened, and we won't have to talk about it. In my defense, <laughs> ghost. Ghosts. <laughs> Uh, about 30 years later, uh, oh yeah, so I already said that. The two of the most common theories surrounding the source of these reported attacks are a demonic shape-shifting creature of Japanese folkloric origins Ooh. known as the Kasha. Ooh, that's awesome though, right? Like, the uh, you know, the Japanese attacked in Pearl Harbor. Like, well, one of them was like so angry, it like brought a fucking demon with it from it. So that was like what I was talking about, where it's like you got to deal with the gods from their homeland. Well, they brought a demon from their homeland and up. they like, they, they just cursed Hawaii with it. Like maybe unknowingly, maybe knowingly, maybe there's some weird movie you could do with that where it's like well to be honest it would probably come off pretty racist so like i don't think you could make it some i don't think you could do that now it would be better if this movie was made in the 70s or 80s but, but still i kind of like this concept of like you're dropping down missiles but like they don't explode they just like they're like filled with freaking like ghosts and demons and stuff and it's just like a di totally different kind of paranormal warfare well see that's cool but that's a different movie all in itself you just set that like in the not too distant future or like some weird alternate reality where it's like Ooh. you know and then yeah we're People like dead soldiers, you you have to keep going on. Ghosts. Yeah, what if that's that'd be a fucked up thing? So like, when, after you're done serving or whatever, your ghost basically gets collected, like a Ghostbuster kind of thing. But now you have to like continue like the rest of your days oh, yeah. serving. You, you, you army, enlist like... how many times that you have to serve, and then once you're dead, it goes by years. So every year you would sign up, you know, in the military and in, in your alive years is worth like a hundred dead years. So it's kind of like the undead army from Lord of the Rings. Like, you know, like you just have, like, this army of freaking ghosts of, like, dead soldiers. That's fucking I don't know. scary. I, I kind of like the idea if they're more feral, though. I don't like the idea of, like, intelligent ghosts, like soldiers, like Lord of the Rings. I like the idea of just, you know, just kind of weird, like, because you drop it and it's, like, uh, like, 13 ghosts. It's just, like, these bunch of ghosts that just, like are all tortured in their own way yeah. and murder in their own way because they're tortured ghosts. And it's like, you're dropping hauntings rather than like an army you can control of ghosts. Right. Yeah. It's, it's hard to, that'll be the, the, the backfire, right? Is how do you contain them now once they're free? Oh, you don't. It's like nukes, man. You make a ghost world. Yeah. Oh, ghost world. Ghost world. Be like, we can't, we don't go to that land. Co copyright Earthling Entertainment. It's like, we, ghost they, world. they lost the <laughs> war, but now it is a land of the dead. Ghost the, world. The spirits run that realm. You don't go down that road. <laughs> ghost world. Ghost world. Copyright Earthling Entertainment. Next haunting. <laughs> oh but seriously that's a great idea i think we could market that 
I think so too. Yeah. You know, maybe if it's a show, the pilot is them dropping the ghost in the whole war. And then the show is like the aftermath of ghost world. Or if it's a movie, the first movie is the war. And then the second movie is ghost war. And then you think of some conclusion to make it a trilogy. That's, that's how you handle that. I think we got a smash hit. A smash hit. Give us $200 million. Yes, please. Just not Netflix. <laughs> well, I I mean, Netflix, We if we get a Netflix deal, you got to get all movies at made at the same time as like a package deal. So that way you at least get to tell your story, whether that does good or not. You know, it's like, oh, well, you got three movies, you know, uh, we're, you know our job's done. That's actually a good way to do it. Yeah. yeah. Smart. I, well, Zack Snyder, I assume, was his deal because he uh, did the Rebel Moon 1 and Rebel Moon 2, and they came out months apart. So he obviously filmed them back to back. That's how you do it. You Lord of the Rings style that crap. That's right. All right. Next haunting. They should have made Bright 2. Next haunting. Anyways. Next haunting. Gene Harlow House. You can't make Bright 2. He smacks somebody on stage. That's true. Next movie. In Los Angeles, California. Wait, wait. What is it? The Gene, the Gene Harlow House. Oh, this is a good one, Ryan. This Bavarian style home in Beverly Hills has a particularly gruesome history. In 1932, it was home to the iconic actress Jean Harlow and her abusive husband, Paul Byrne, who shot himself in the head while standing in front of a mirror. Their butler discovered him and called MGM instead of the police, so there were tons of rumors that it wasn't actually suicide. That's kind of crazy, right? Like this, he works for the studio. The studio will take care of this. They'll know what to do. They'll know how to spin this one. I'll bet that's some kind of thing, though, right? Like where it's like, if anything crazy goes down, don't you dare call. Like you call us. Like we'll call the cops. Well, that might be that might be the way it was back then. Yeah, makes sense. I believe it's not that way now. People aren't owned by giant corporations. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> We're sitting in front of a window. I'm scared. I know. All right, continue. <laughs> Many suspected Burns' ex-girlfriend, a suspicion exacerbated by her jumping off of a boat to her death a couple of days later. Jean moved out after his death, but died only a few years later at the age of 26. So the girlfriend committed suicide or was murdered to cover up the truth. Yeah. Some cement shoes. And then he died later at 26. Okay, wow. Well, yeah, yeah. That's, that's not very old. Uh, but wait, it gets creepier. I uh, wait, that's ma. But wait, that's ma. In 1963, celebrity hairstylist Jay Sebring brought the home, bought the home, and lived there with his girlfriend Sharon Tate until she left him for Roman Polanski. And that's a whole different kind of worms. They were still friends and remained so until both of them were murdered by the Charles Manson cult. That was the kind of worms. Tate was the same age as Harlow when she passed. It was a ghost thing. They made a pack. You die when I die, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry. sorry, that was bitch. <laughs> but back to when the couple lived in the Harlow house, Tate told several friends of creepy occurrences in the home and even mentioned it in interviews. Yeah, it's actually true. She did mention that she thought she was in a haunted house. They made a movie called The Haunting of Sher uh, Sharon Tate, and it stars Hilary Duff, believe it or not, <laughs> playing Cheryl Tate, or Sharon Tate, excuse me, during this time where she was in a supposed haunted house. Interesting. I isn't didn't that, know that. Isn't that weird? Yeah. I don't think the movie did particularly well, but uh, it, it exists. Check yeah. it out. I love Hilary. Hilary Duff. Hilary Duff, yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. She's a great actress. The, uh, she did the How I Met Your Mother spinoff, where it was like How I Met Your Father. I think it only lasted two seasons, but it was all right, you know? That yeah. was, I think that was the latest thing she did. And then she also did a show that lasted uh, six seasons or something like that called Younger. So she's always been working, you know? She's doing good. Good. Good for her. Uh, hey, you brought it up, and I know a lot of useless knowledge, No, Ryan. no, <laughs> no, I'm all about it. I'm glad to hear that she's still working. She's the shit. Damn right. <laughs> uh, for example, once... She when she was sleeping in the master bedroom alone. Okay, wait, wait. This is back. This is Sharon Tate that happened. Correct. Yes. She saw a creepy little man. Her friends say she believed it to be Paul Burns' ghost. Sharon Tate was so freaked out when she saw the alleged ghost that she ran out of the room, and then saw a hanging shadowy corpse with its throat slit in the hallway. Damn. 
That's crazy, right? It was the 60s, so it could have been drugs, but she did say this happened. Could have been drugs, could have happened, could be ghosts. And then she was killed by the Manson family, which is rough. You that's know, if, rough. If, yeah, that's rough. That's rough. You know, try not to get murdered if you could if you could help it, Ryan. Like it's it's not not fun. Like what was it? It was in the Odd Thomas book <laughs> series where like he would see like dark spirits around someone who was like going to die. Or whatever, I wonder if, like, that's what was going on there. Like, just... Oh, that's pretty cool. You know? I will say, I do I do prefer the Quentin Tarantino version where uh, they go to the house next door and get murdered by TV stars. That, that you know, that tracks? Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Yeah, I still ending. haven't seen that. I'm okay. terrible. Well, it ends with the Sharon Tate... Excuse me, spoiler. It ends with the Sharon Tate murders, but instead of them murdering Sharon Tate, they go to the wrong house, and the next-door neighbor, which is Brad Pitt... At, no, I think it's uh, <coughs> uh, what's his name, Titanic. Uh, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. I think it's Leonardo DiCaprio. Anyways, he burns him with a flamethrower. Well, yeah, and they uh, they like beat him up in the house, and they kill they kill the Manson kids. Well, some of them, I think, a few get arrested, but it, like it goes crazy wrong. It's kind of like Inglorious Bastards, where they killed Hitler. Yes, that was. That it's was called a revisionary, you know, history. All right, guys, are you ready for haunting, I believe, number five? Hotel Monte Vista. Hotel Monte Vista. In Flagstaff, Arizona. Yeah, yeah. The Hotel Monte Vista, which opened as the community hotel in 1927, has a history of underground opium dens, uh, speakeasies, and gambling. Mm, Nom, 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 opium. (laughs) <laughs> today sorry that ho- doesn't work that well when it's an illicit Opioids. substance <laughs> the, the hotel is known for the paranormal activity that haunts some of the rooms and halls guests who've stayed in room 220 have experienced the tv changing channels on its own accord and some have said they've felt cold hands touching them in their sleep see that's some creepy stuff if i'm ever sleeping and i get that sensation of someone touching me I would be freaked out. Like hauntings, I've never experienced what I would consider like an actual haunting. Like the most I've seen is I've seen I've seen shadow people, which, you know, in the moment you're like, well, maybe that was just the eyes playing a trick on me. You know, it's it's you can debate it. Yeah. I've never seen anything where it's like, no, this is definitive. I agree. And I feel like, you know, it could be sleep paralysis, maybe it's a dream, but still, if I have the sensation of someone grabbing me while I'm in bed, I'm I might believe at that point. I think I would too. That's rough. That's scary. That's horrifying. Because ma- the bed is your safe space, man. Yeah, that's like <laughs> that's when you, as a grown man, you get down and you look under the bed after something like that. Oh no! See, luckily I have too much stuff under my bed. Like a goblin could, like if I was, <laughs> if there was critters, like the '80s movies where they were kind of like hedgehog things that eat you alive, but or, is... or gremlins, then maybe they could fit under the bed. But it's too too but small is, for this. A is a demon. hotel. So this oh is my a... god! You're right. So, yeah, that's even worse. This because changes everything. It's a strange place. No. Yeah, so it's even worse. No one needs to grab me in my sleep. I was just talking in generality. Just, excuse me, generally. I can't talk right now. Anyways, I was just saying <laughs> in plain English. Right. <laughs> that if I was in bed, I felt that. But you're talking in this place. Yeah, yeah that makes yeah. sense. That's and, the topic. I get it. Yeah, and and that, make, like I said, that makes it so much worse. Like, hotels are such a, they're, they're kind of naturally a creepy place, right? Aren't they, hotel rooms? Like, there's something creepy. You don't know who's been there. You don't know what's happened. Like, you, you know. You well, don't... yeah, and it has, like, a weird dollhouse feel because yeah. there's the same little paintings and everything's just, like, you know, in order. And it's just, like, it's just where it needs to be. Uh, you know, Stephen King has done obviously The Shining, which is very famous haunting of a uh, hotel. Room but he also fourteen oh eight. Fourteen oh eight. That's my favorite. I, I, love I know that that's movie. a short story. I don't know if the short story is called fourteen oh eight, but I don't know. Anyways, uh, that was a scary movie, and that, that was, was a haunted where the, just the room was haunted. It was good. That was a good. It was effed up, man. Like the things that that room did to him was really messed up. It was. Well, let's see what happened to this room in uh, Flagstaff. There's also reportedly a phantom bellboy who knocks on doors and announces room service. That that could just be a homeless guy. <laughs> but when guests get to the door, no one's there. Oh, never mind. He's a very fast bum. 
the, the fastest bum in all the land. He knocks and door down dishes, and he's like, knock, 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 toodles. <laughs> he gets his kick off mischief. Fastest bum alive. <laughs> fastest bum alive. One of the more popular is the sound of an infant crying in the basement. Apparently, staff have found themselves running upstairs to escape the sound of the cries. Though the sounds are very real to those who hear them, there has been no information that has explained the phenomenon. Yeah, I got nothing to that. That's horrifying. Creepy kids, man. Yeah, well, you don't want to be in the basement and hear the crying of a baby or a child. You just, because you're, you're dead. You're dead. I mean, over. your best bet is to get out of there and call the cops. But yep. how many of us yep. can do that? That's yep. You know, just don't try not to fall too many times. Ugh, creepy. All right, guys. So we have one final haunting for you in this week's spooky stuff. The Crescent Hotel in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. Another hotel, people. Strap in. In 1937, millionaire inventor Norman G. Baker posed as a doctor and turned the hotel into a hospital. Posed as a doctor? That doesn't seem shady at all. Not at all. Baker had a fetish for the color purple. He painted many sections of the hospital in the color, and today, the chimneys remain that same purple. Baker was known to wear purple shirts and ties. He drove a purple car. He claimed... He's just a big old creep. <laughs> He likes Grimace. He's like, ah, you guys, I once worked for McDonald's. What if he was Grimace? What if it was the real Grimace who got fired from McDonald's? He was genetically engineered to be a mascot in the 80s. But then when they were brought down, when Puff and Stuff sued McDonald's land and they had to tear down their whole magical world, when the 80s dream was over and McDonald's became boring and industrial, Grimace was thrown to the side. And now he became this weird doctor to get his revenge. Because what they don't tell you is he invited all of those people who made that decision in that courtroom, who screwed them over and made them lose the lawsuit against Puff and Stuff. And then he one by one killed Cures them from their diseases. <laughs> it's a true story. Means and fighting, and it, we just gotta wait until Grimace is in a in public domain, like Winnie the Pooh. Man, we got like seventy years. We can make this movie, Ryan. We just gotta wait. We just gotta live. We gotta live long enough, and we can make this Grimace movie. Anyways, back to this haunting. Doctor's a dick, posing like a doctor, not a real doctor, and uh, he's like purple, which was the point of this joke. All right, here we go. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Too much? I really committed to that one. <laughs> you really did. We will survive. We will survive. He claimed that he could cure cancer. So people came from all over with hopes of curing their illnesses. Most who were treated died. Bah, wah, wah. Eventually. Sorry, that's not funny. No, it's not. Baker was exposed and ran out of town. Today, the property is an active hotel. It's said to be haunted by several ghosts, including a bearded man wearing Victorian clothing and a five-year-old girl. Ooh, Victorian clothing would be creepy. Ryan, would you go to that hotel? Like, if there was this, this hotel, which is made from an a, a place that was a hotel, then turned to a hospital, but it was a fake doctor who had a fetish for purple, treated people, didn't do a good job, they all died, they were tortured in this place, then it was turned back into a hotel. Are you getting a room? Honestly, probably. Really? Yeah. All right, because I think we can do this. <laughs> uh, Arkansas's not that far, Ryan. We can make this happen. Arkansas, not that far. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, that's uh, that's spooky stuff for this week. That was a good one, Joe. Thank you, sir. Those yeah. are good stories. Yeah, well, just like I said, we've been doing a lot of monsters and cryptozoology, and we always talk at the beginning of the show about, like, you know, we do the spooky, the haunted, and we haven't done a haunting in a really long time. Like, it's been 10, 15 I think, episodes. I think <laughs> it's been since we opened the vault. Oh, man. No, that was like two two days ago. What are you talking about? No, we did the one vault where we had, like, a ton of different ones, and uh, I want to say that we did it then. Yeah, there was a little bit of ghosts. I'm just saying. I'm categories. just saying. Ghosts are few and far between. Right, because I remember we had like stupid dicks, and like we had one of them was ghosts. Yes, <laughs> yes, that was uh, that was a good episode. That was a great episode. I think this one will rival it. Perfect entertainment, that's a real part. So 
it turns out that Gina Davis will not be returning for Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. I guess that makes sense because her character's dead and ghosts aren't supposed to age. And what are you going to do? I guess you could do the de-aging thing, but that's kind of played out. No one wants to see that. Safe to assume Alec Baldwin won't show up either. You know, because once again, dead. Anyways, this is better than regular tables, Mr. Report. Riot Disclosure Discussion. <laughs> it's about aliens and stuff. Awesome. It is these. It is the tales today, guys. We had a bunch of hauntings. Now we get a bunch of alien abductions. Strap in. I hope you're ready. I'm the hype man. Hoo-hoo. Yeah. And, and what a hype man you are, sir. Yes. Hudson. I wear a big clock. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, boy. Hudson Valley UFO Wave. Ooh, I like this one. Between 1982 and 1986, around 5,000 eyewitnesses reported seeing V-shaped UFOs, which I think are actually making a comeback, uh, with multicolored lights flying near the Hudson Valley, just one hour north of New York City. So now, are these UFOs flying in a V formation, or are the UFOs shaped like an arrowhead? Yeah, V-shaped. Like, 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 straight up, like a, like a wide V. Excellent. Continue. The first sighting was made on New Year's Eve, 1982, by a retired police officer in Kent, New York. The former officer initially thought that he was observing an airplane. When the craft passed above his home, he realized it was moving far too slowly and quietly to be an airplane. While most of the eyewitnesses described a slow-moving V-shaped UFO... Other reports said the object appeared to be circular and capable of moving at fantastic speeds or disappearing altogether. During one sighting, the UFO hovered about 30 feet above the Indian Point nuclear plant. The security supervisor was considering shooting the craft down before it disappeared from sight. You know, it's weird how they always go to nuclear plants. That's a very common thing for very. UFOs, yeah. It makes you wonder if that's like a form, like a source of power for them, maybe. Well, they're definitely interested. Despite eyewitness reports and photographic evidence, the phenomenon was never properly explained. All right, so they have photos, even? Evidently. We're, I'm going to have to do some digging. Okay, well, never explained. That's That makes sense, because if it was explained, we'd be like, oh, yeah, aliens. You mean the Garathagars? Yeah, they're from planet Neptune. We all, Yeah, everyone knows about them. That that's guy like, owes that's me old, five bucks. That's old news. Yeah, so it makes sense anything UFO has been explained. Right. I'm just saying. Yeah. It just seems like a redundant statement. All right. You're not wrong. All right. Anyways, All right. here is the next UFO story. I like that one, though. That, I one, did, that was a wave. good one. Yeah, that was one of my favorites. I mean, 5,000 eyewitnesses. Yeah. Just a couple people saw it. Yeah, no, nothing to see here. All right, guys. Nothing to say here. <laughs> nothing to say. Just not a, a thingy dingy. It's a weather balloon. No. (laughs) Shag Harbor UFO incident. The Shag Harbor UFO is Canada's equivalent of the Roswell UFO in the United States. On October 4th, I know that harbor. That's the harbor everyone went to have sex to in the 70s. Oh, we all used to go there. eh? Oh, yeah, the Shag Harbor. Uh, Yep. After after we got some Tim Hortons. eh? Sorry, that was not worth interrupting you. I was just trying to think of a joke and... I don't know, Shag Harbor. It went to, uh, you know, Austin Powers. It did. Yeah. Shag vibes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just, you know, that's, oh, yeah, that's the harbor people go and have sex. Yeah. 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 That's the thing. You know, just start this one over. I, I retract the joke. Continue. Start over. <laughs> uh, it, it's U- the Shag Harbor UFO is uh, Canada's equivalent of the Roswell UFO for the United States. On October 4th, 1967, an unknown object crashed into the water near the tiny fishing village of Shag Harbor, Nova Scotia. At least 11 people watched the object as it headed towards the harbor. Multiple witnesses heard a whistling sound and a loud bang as it crashed into the water. Shortly afterwards, Laurie Wickens and four of his friends contacted the Royal Canadian Mounted Police after they spotted a large object floating in the Atlantic Ocean about 1,000 feet from the shore. I thought it said it hit a lake. No, wait, it's a harbor. It's fine. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's in the harbor. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, in my head, it was like a lake. You know what it was? That was like the uh, Friday the 13th Part 8 where they were in the boat and somehow went from Crystal Lake to the ocean in New York and there was no recollection for it. That's what my brain did. It, it just, was just carved like, right through yeah, the land. Yeah, it just was like, no, that's fine. Yeah, yeah the harbor. Sorry, my bad. You know, geography, <laughs> it's fine. The RCMP, the Royal Canadian Navy and the Royal Canadian Air Force became involved in an unsuccessful recovery effort. The investigation revealed that all commercial, private, and military aircraft along the eastern seaboard were accounted for. The Navy... Okay, so it definitely wasn't one of ours. Right. The it's Navy... kind of cool, though. It was just floating in the ocean. I mean, I don't know. They probably didn't have diving equipment, but it's just, it's you, you got to check that out if you could, right? Right. Uh, it says, uh, so they were all there. The Navy combed the seafloor of the Gulf of Maine, uh, but found no trace of the object. That sucks. I mean, it makes sense, right? It would sink, or it would fly away, or whatever. Or go to the rest of their colony under the ocean. Oh, ba 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 ja ba 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 what what is it? USOs? Yes. Yes. Unidentified submergical objects. Submergical. <laughs> submergical. <laughs> hey but, man, I'm tired. All right. My kid was up last night. He's teething. Uh, hey, all right. Just yeah, because you're good. I, what you're are you good. doing? What are you doing? Making fun. I Anyways. Hey, yeah, you know, I stumble myself, my my friend. Uh but okay, so I got another one here. Uh this one's called the Westall UFO. Uh around eleven AM. On April 6, 1966. There's a lot of UFO sightings back in the 60s, it seems. Yeah, well, it was the big UFO boom, man. There was, like, waves of sightings, which means that it's either real and the aliens do come in waves, or maybe they've updated their techniques, or it was, uh, you know, some of it is hysteria. I mean, you know, a lot of these are credible, and then a lot of these are just nonsense. That's what's, That's the fun thing. Is picking out the, oh, well, that guy is like a cop and this is a real witness or there's a thousand witnesses versus there was one guy named Ted who who saw it. No one else did. You know, there's it's I don't know. It's fun. It's a fun story. But yeah, you're right. Some are just more credible than others. Exactly. Uh, so uh, an unexplained flying object flew around Westall High School in Melbourne, Australia. More than 200 students and several teachers watched the UFO as it descended into a nearby field. Well, you know this is credible. See, this one is true because you never get that many people who are that age to, like, have their story collaborate with if it was fake. You get all your classmates to agree to say the same thing? That's impossible. And I want to say I saw a documentary that included this, and they interviewed a lot of the people that were there. Very cool. Eyewitnesses watched the craft hovering around the school for approximately 20 minutes. The object was described as being a gray saucer-shaped object that classic, was about classic. That, that was about twice the size of a family car. That seems pretty small. It seems about average. Twice the size of a family car? Seems about average for is a it, little UFO. Little okay. Guys. I, yeah. Okay. Well, they're either small stature, like these aliens are only a foot big, or interstellar travel is not hard for them because they're like, how could you store everything you need in like your family car? You'd have to go through a wormhole or something, Ryan. You can't just travel that far with no supplies. This is madness. If you believe Bob Lazar, he was able to inspect some of these small UFOs, and he said there was literally just a couple freaking chairs. And a spot below the deck where the anti-gravity device went. And, like, a small spot above the deck, but, like, there was no bathrooms. There was no nothing. It was all powered by the brain. Another idea is that they're uh, they're not necess- they're either not organic or they're, like, basically engineered. They're, they're drones. They're, right. like, what we would send. We would send a drone, right? Well, maybe these aliens, the greys, as we see them, are just alien versions of drones. It is a... It is a thought. And that actually is a people talk about the mantis type aliens, the mantis grays, yeah. and how they might be in charge. And the ones that are the classic bulbous head grays are like like, you know, helper ants. Like think of an ant colony, right? Like they're the they're the workers. So and they got like a hive mind almost kind perhaps of Perhaps it's a theory, you know, there's a lot of fun ones. Because they never really talk. They don't really look like they can, you know really eat or anything like any kind of report on that like you've never seen them they don't have ears you know yeah look up the mantis grays it's a it's a very interesting story the theory that some abductees and experiencers have reported 
uh, jumping uh, back into the Westall UFO, uh, there were were no commercial, private, or Royal Australian Air Force planes in that area at the time. Once it, again, not one of ours. It was suggested that a weather balloon may have been responsible for the confusion. Like, fuck, what do we say? I don't know. Weather balloon. Are you serious? Word for the Americans. I just, no, we could do better than that. What? What's better, Terry? What? Next week. Uh, there was a weather balloon. And swamp gas. And swamp gas. But eyewitnesses quickly dismissed these explanations. The Australian skeptic suggested that the object was an experimental military craft similar to the nylon target drogues that were towed by RAAF planes at the time. I mean, that's that's very possible. It's possible. But the Air Force reported that they were not in the airspace at the time of this incident. Well, fair enough, but if it was classified, they they, they wouldn't tell you, right? Yeah, they would have lied, definitely. Uh, So I got one more here. Anchorage, Alaska, on November 18th, 1986, a Japanese Boeing 747 cargo aircraft. He says he's got one more here. To be clear, we have one, two, three, four. We have like five more, guys. Strap in. Strap in. All right, start this one over. I didn't mean to interrupt. You're fine. Uh, it's Anchorage, Alaska on not- November 18th, 1986. A Japanese Boeing 747 cargo aircraft was followed for nearly an hour by an unidentified flying object. The crew witnessed two objects flying while flying over eastern Alaska. As the objects got closer to the plane, the cabin was lit up and filled with a strange heat. As the two objects flew away, yeah, a much larger disc-shaped craft emerged from the darkness and started to follow the 747. Captain Terauchi contacted Anchorage Air Traffic Control and requested a change of course. The UFO followed the plane despite any of the captain's maneuvers. All of the data, including ground radar that captured the unidentified craft, was collected and presented at a meeting with the FBI and the CIA. After reviewing all of the material, the government officials decided that this was the first radar recording of a UFO. However, they insist that their meeting never took place. Didn't happen. Nothing to say here. Again. But it's the first the first ever on uh, radar. That's pretty that's a pretty cool uh, that's I don't know. That's a fun statistic. That's a fu- that's, that's a fun piece of information. I knew Anchorage was a big deal when it came to to disclosure and UFO and stuff, but I, I didn't know that they were like the first considered the first one to have that. That's great. That is uh, all right. So here we go. Here's the next UFO encounter. Chicago O'Hare International Airport. You know, just that small place. <laughs> My God. On November seventh, two thousand six, a metallic saucer shaped craft was seen hovering over the O'Hare International Airport in Chicago. John Hilkovich from Chicago Tribune reportedly said, It is John Hilkovich. I thought you were just like John Melkovich. Nope. Uh, he wasn't there. No. No, it, it, it was uh, John Hilkovich. It is Hilkovich. Yeah, weird. John Hilkovich. The disc <laughs> was visible for approximately two minutes and was seen by close to a dozen United Airline employees ranging from pilots to supervisors. The object apparently shot straight up and carved a visible circular hole through the clouds. I remember this. That is crazy. I remember hearing about this. The Federal Aviation Administration initially claimed that they didn't have any information about the sighting. Nope, nope, nope. What do you mean? We we don't know. I was at lunch. Uh... Nothing. (laughs) Nothing. The Chicago Tribune then filed a Freedom of Information Act request. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, it's a good thing those exist. Which uncovered recorded conversation concerning the UFO. The FAA suggested that the sighting was the result of a weather phenomenon called a hole punch cloud. That's convenient. <laughs> yeah. Did that exist before they claimed that's what it was? Ooh, but the temperatures that day made this explanation impossible. Meteorologist said, you're wrong, buster. You're lying. Then the FAA said that the airport lights were responsible for the sighting, but the lights hadn't been turned on yet. A proper investigation was never conducted. Never mind why they didn't turn on their lights. 
Never mind that a bunch of pilots saw a UFO fly off and create a hole. They saw it do it. I've, I've listened about this one. But yeah, so that's another really good one. I'm liking these so far. So I'm going to move right along here to the next one. Moving right along because there's more than Ryan thought there was. And our show's running long. I knew there was a lot. It's going to be a good long episode. Alderney UFO sighting. Captain Ray Boyer was flying a routine 45-minute flight from Southampton, England on April 23, 2007, when he and his passengers saw two UFOs as they approached Alderney. The Jersey Airport radar control recorded the two large yellow cigar-shaped objects for over 55 minutes. The cigar-shaped ones. We got V-shaped ones. We got scar-shaped ones. We have... uh... We have saucer-shaped ones. It makes you wonder that one of two things, right? They're either, there's not aliens visiting us. What if it's like a bunch of aliens? Like, what if, honestly, it's straight-up Star Trek just right outside our our atmosphere and the governments know about it and they're interacting with aliens and it's some weird sci-fi world that we live in, but we don't get to know about it because we're stuck here in the mundane, Ryan. I hate it. I hate it. I, if, if sci-fi exists, I want to be a part of it, damn it. Maybe they, yeah. This they, is why we should have studied and become scientists or, like, pilots or something. Maybe they come here for water and just, like, to replenish nuclear power or something. Like I don't know, but there's all the point is there's all these different UFOs. Right. So, so there's different factions coming at us. Either that or the alien race are, like, a kind of race that just takes technology. What if they go to different worlds, conquer that world, take their technology, and we're just next. They got the V-shaped UFO people. They got the circle-shaped UFO people. They got the Tic Tac people. Now they got the cigar people. Where will it end? When will it end, Ryan? I don't think it ever will, Joe. Sci-fi. Sci-fi. Gotta love it. Another pilot flying a plane near Sark also confirmed the presence and location of these mysterious crafts. BBC Radio Gurnes... Gurnsey. Sorry, Gurnsey. Also reported that visitors in a hotel in Sark had noticed and inquired about the two bright yellow objects in the sky. Hey, uh, what's, uh, what's, what's that, uh, thing up there? <laughs> That's a good question. Like, I don't know. I run a fucking hotel. I'm not like in charge of the sky. Housekeeping. <laughs> During an address to the U.S. The National Press Club. I Thank you. Thank you. I've killed Joe. Okay. I killed Joe, guys. I've killed Joe. Oh my god. (laughs) It's it's just the idea of them talking to someone who doesn't have any idea what they're saying. And (laughs) that you think it's just really funny to me. (laughs) Mike, you did that and a whole scene went through my head. And let me tell you, Ryan. If you can't entertain yourself, then what's the point? That right. was that was genius. You don't even know. Woo! Thank you. Thank you. All right. During an address to the U.S. National Press Club of November on November 12, 2007, Captain Boyer said, the British Civil Aviation Authority knew within 20 minutes of the sighting what was seen, as described in a flight log, and faxed directly to the relevant CAA office. Despite... Not the irrelevant office, the relevant one. That's right. He picked the right one. Ah, that's a good thing you came. This is the general store. You go to the specific store, you can only get, you know, nuts. I've Brazil all... nuts. I Very almost specific. made a mistake. I almost made a grave good, mistake. Good for cholesterol, but bad for cookies. Indeed. Despite the pilot's openness about the incident, the cooperation of the military, and countless eyewitness reports from passengers and people on the ground, the incident remains a complete mystery. We just don't know. And we never will. We never will. All right, guys, we got two left. No, three? We have three left for you, so I hope you're ready. Here's our next alien UFO encounter. The Belgian UFO wave. 
Between November of 1989 and April of 1990, thousands of people reported, uh, reportedly witnessed triangular UFOs flying over various parts of Belgium. Oh, yeah, those are the Lubtees. I know about those. That's a good model. I'm just saying, if they're if they're not scavenger race and they are all different races, you got to have names. And I know of the Greys. I know of the Nordics. Uh, what do we got here? We have the Reptilians. Yeah. What you know? And I'm just saying, there's got to be a robot one because there's always an AI version. Right. Yeah. So I made one up. A Lipti. Figure out what it is. Maybe that's an insectoid. I don't know. I don't know. Tune in next <laughs> week to find out. On multiple occasions, the Belgian officials even tracked these objects using radar. During the evening of March 30th, 1990, an estimated 13,500 people watched as the UFOs were chased by two F-16s. Over the course of an hour, the two F-16s made nine attempts to intercept the UFOs and were able to make a radar lock with their targets. Not ten, though. They weren't going to go that far. Thank God. Got to draw the line somewhere, right? Yeah. What, are we mad? During one of the radar locks, the UFO accelerated from 150 miles per hour to over 1,100 miles per hour while changing altitude from 9,000 feet to 5,000 feet in a matter of seconds. I mean, this is some Top Gun Maverick stuff, okay? Tom Cruise style. Ten Even knots. Maverick would be splattered to the side of his window doing that. No, he invented the inertial dampeners that kind of bridge us from the, you know, Top Gun of the 80s to the sci-fi franchise it is born to be. He's the fastest man alive. After his Sonic? <laughs> yes. After his retirement, Major General Wilfred de Brouwer wrote in a statement that the Belgian UFO wave was exceptional and the Air Force could not justify the na- identify the nature, origin, and intentions of the reported phenomena. Yeah, we don't fucking know. The Belgian uh, objects have never been explained. The Belgian objects have never been explained. Yeah. Still. Well, once again, I mean, most most things a UFO have not been explained. Otherwise, we would be, you know, shaking hands with aliens. Right, and I'm ready for that day. I am too. I'm what ready. a fancy day that would be. That would be a wonderful effing day. Like, I don't know. I mean, well, it would be. I mean, here's the thing. It depends, because if they were able to get to us before we can get to them, then that means they have greater technology than us. And at that point, it really depends on their intention. It is rough, but the most things in our world are kind of like conquer and take over if you have better technology. Think of the American Indians when we came uh, west, the European came west and took it over. Think about any time in history. We find a tribe of this untouched nature living world, and we destroy them with technology and modern day life. So, if these aliens show up and uh, they are any kind of hostile, we're pretty screwed. Yeah. Yeah, especially if they're meat eaters, because there is a chance that they would eat us, because there is a lot of us. There's, what, four, five, seven billion? There's yeah. something ridiculous. That's num, 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 num. Casey so, humans. The best we could hope for is, uh, in a, you know, like an ambivalent race that, like, really, that they're plant eaters and they're like, no, we're just sign. We, we need the Vulcans, man. See, that's why Star Trek worked out in that universe, because the Vulcans were peaceful and they're logical. Well, they're not necessarily, like, peaceful, but they're logical. They're not going to just attack you. They're, the point is, they're enlightened versus just, like, V, the miniseries with the reptilians that are just like, mmm, meat. I would rather hang out with the Vulcans, I think. Yeah, they, I don't think they could take a joke, though. That would be the only thing. It's very stale at parties. Yeah, yeah, but, but you know, Spock's the man, though. But he's half human. He is half human, yeah. And in not all iterations, but my favorite iteration, Winona Ryder's his mom. Nice. Yeah, yeah. I'm into that. You know, the Calvin timeline that J.J. Abrams created? Yes. Like I said, I love those movies. Well, there's going to be one more, a fourth Star Trek movie, and it's going to be the last one, but it is going to have that cast of Chris Pine and all of them. Sadly, uh, obviously, we can't have the gentleman who played Chekhov because he died. Yep. Those movies were good. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, me too. All right. Uh, here we go. Uh, oh, sadly, we only have two aliens left, right? Yeah, we do. This is the uh, last two. Last two. Okay. Cash Landrum Incident. On December 29th, 1980, Betty Cash, Vicky Landrum, and Kobe Landrum saw 23 unidentified helicopters surrounding a huge diamond-shaped object that was hovering above the trees. 
the object emitted such tremendous heat that the outside of the car was too painful to touch, and a handprint was seared onto the soft and vinyl interior. That's really gross. A Dayton police officer, Detective Lamar <laughs> Walker, and his wife also claimed to have seen helicopters near the same area. After the incident, the group suffered from vomiting, diarrhea, and terrible burning sensations. Yeah, that sounds like radiation. That's not good. Right. Betty Cash developed painful blisters on her skin, lost clumps of her hair, and was unable to walk. A radiologist examined the group and concluded that they were all suffering from secondary damage from ionizing radiation. They sued the U.S. government for $20 million, but the case was dismissed in 1986. Some people still believe that the government covered up its involvement in the incident. This is one of those where I feel like this might be us messing with nuclear power, trying to imitate, trying to reverse engineer alien technology that we've recovered. That's what I think, and it's just a failed experiment. Well, you could be totally right, but there's a lot of uh, you know cosmic radiation and rays and just things that we as a species have never been exposed to because you know we have the atmosphere and the ionosphere and all that stuff. Uh, so you never know. It feels like radiation. Who knows how it would affect things off our planet? Like you say, like I know radiation is like a thousand little tiny bullets that like go through your cells and rip them apart, and that's kind of why you you degrade, for lack of a better word. Um, and that's, you know, in the layman version. But the point is, do all species respond the way we do to that kind of, you know, exposure? No idea. Like, like there could be organisms that function that we can't even fathom in a different way. Like, maybe that is a form of sustenance for them, being around that kind of radioactive power. Maybe that makes them live longer. Insane. I mean, according to Fallout, which, by the way, we have a spoiler review at the end of this. Yes. Uh, you know, radiation sometimes just turns you into a super awesome monster thing. You yeah. Never know. Never you know. Never know. But anyways, jump back into the UFO thing. All right. Here's the last one. Uh, Rendlesham Forest. The Rendlesham Forest in England. Thank I love you. this one. There's a book uh, I have on it. Rendlesham Forest Incident. A UFO was observed on December 26, 1980 in England's Rendlesham Forest near the Royal Air Force Station in Woodbridge. After witnessing some unexplained lights, several Air Force personnel, including Lieutenant Colonel Charles I, Halt, decided to head into the woods to get a closer look. They were expecting to find a plane crash. Instead, according to Halt's memo, they saw a glowing metallic object that moved at a phenomenal light speed through the forest. The next day, servicemen returned to the site and found triangular-shaped impressions on the ground, broken branches on the trees, and radiation readings that were ten times the normal background level. In 2010, retired Lieutenant Halt signed and notarized affidavit that summarized the incident and accused the U.S. and England of a cover-up. While some believe it was a hoax or a fallen Soviet satellite, others think this was a legitimate UFO sighting. It's weird. This uh, He said in interviews that when he touched it, he got this image of a bunch of ones and zeros, and he went home and he wrote them down, and then they like they had a computer guy translate it, and it was like it had a message. I remember this. Yeah. That was a thing. That was a good uh, Ryan's dis- excuse me Ryan's disclosure discussion. I love that. That yep. was fun, and it was a, it was good to have all those different tales. I mean, the, you know, the reason why we do those is because these are classics, classic stories. But there's not more information. There's not. We can't be a segment in of itself. So putting them together in this cluster of a bunch of you know really fast stories. I mean, I I love it. And it's important to retell these stories because I think that's what kind of keeps it alive. That's what's like, don't forget about these things. This happened. Yeah, there's a lot of things that add up. Okay, guys. Well, I'm excited to say we are now in the latter half of our episode, which is the entertainment section. And we're going to jump right in with what we like to call Earthling Entertainment Headlines. Hey, hey. So I want to start with... Uh, Paramount announced at CinemaCon. So for those of you who don't know, CinemaCon is a convention for basically movie theater owners, the people who uh, actually put the movie out there. The studios come and they have this big convention. It's in Vegas. 
even, it's hard to get tickets, but even if you can get tickets, it's like $1,300. Anyways, uh, a bunch of movie announcements happen at CinemaCon, and one of the things, the thing I'm really excited about, is they Paramount did it. Something that I was always hoping would happen, but I, I, I didn't believe it. Like, when I first found this news, I was like, this can't be true. But Paramount is doing, because, you know, once again, Paramount, owns Nickelodeon. Nickelodeon owns the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And they announced... Foreshadowing? They announced that they are doing a rated R Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movie. This is going to be the adaptation of the very, very, very famous that uh, came out recently, The Last Ronin Storyline. Uh, great series. It was, uh, I think, six comics. They've, they've since continued it in another version of it. And it is the story of... A turtle, one of the turtles. It's a big mystery at first. You find out the end of the first issue who the surviving turtle is, but all the brothers are dead, and there's one tur- turtle left, and he's got all the weapons. He uses all of them, and it is like this futuristic world, and it, it's very violent, very adults, made that by the original creators. Uh, it, it just, I'm so excited. How do you feel about this? You do you can you believe that Nickelodeon, who owns the property, a kids, you know show is going to make a rated r ninja turtle it's been announced paramount announced it and i heard that they're going to be doing like live action so they will be bringing back the suit that's what i hear too which would be great like the original trilogy that came out uh so i am not surprised at all because it's a smart move they know our generation is ready for something like this they and they see the popularity like you said with the last ronin it, that went viral. That was huge. And it was only one, like you said, six freaking comics. Yeah, it's a, it's an amazing story. But, you know, doing it live action, they can get away with it because the character, he's wearing a lot of suit. He's wearing a lot of armor. So, like, if you could pretty much just make his head the turtle and as long as he's bulky, it would be pretty easy to do the suits. And the original ones, the guys, you know, they're running around and they're full, you know, essentially naked turtles. And, yeah, they, it has to be all suit. This could you can just have padding underneath that's shaped like a turtle. You know what I mean? Because he's, like, dressed like a ninja. I think, yeah, I I think they're going to see huge success with this. I really do. I hope they do. You know, I was surprised when they did the Ninja Turtles versus Batman, not versus, but meets Batman crossover. It was an animated film by Warner Brothers Animation, and uh, that was rated PG-13. It wasn't R, but it was a more adult turtle thing. So, but going rated R, I'm, I'm surprised. I'm happy. I'm excited for it. That's that's exactly that's the only way they really could have done it, I think. <clears throat> Excuse me, water went down the wrong tube. I agree. So yay! Rated R Ninja Turtles. If you're a Ninja Turtle fan, that is amazing. And we're gonna jump into our next topic, which is not much to say here. That uh, if you don't know, Godzilla has a television show called Monarch. It is on Apple TV Plus. And uh yeah, it's pretty good. It had Kurt Russell and his son in it playing the same character in two different timelines. Uh you know, all in the same universe, but one was in, I believe, like the 60s and one is nowadays. Very cool. And that is has uh, been renewed for season two. Cool. Uh, did you get a chance to watch that? No, I've never gotten a chance to watch that, but I would. Sounds cool. I like Godzilla. Godzilla's been getting a lot of love lately. Exactly. It's like a Godzilla resurgence. We have a Godzilla X Kong movie out right now in theaters that did amazing. It's opening weekend. Did better than everyone thought, and it just keeps making money. And then Godzilla... Uh, Godzilla minus one, I believe it was yeah, called. Yeah. It was the Japanese Toho film that won a freaking Oscar for best special effects. So it, it might be the years I, sh- I should say, because last year, you know, it came out the years of Godzilla. We're in the era of giant Kaiju, Ryan. I like it. No, I think that's good. Maybe we can, I hate to say it. Can we come up with something new? Uh, <laughs> no, Godzilla needs to last forever. Godzilla is like doctor who, and uh, it just needs to keep going, man. I agree. Which, by the way, I don't continue. But like I said, like you could make something new that's kind of like, you know, to the same kind of kind of thing. I do hear what you're saying. But giant monsters is kind of a it's its own genre in Japan. I mean, you got to realize they have what Power Rangers is based on was from a show where they fought giant monsters. You know what I mean? Like giant monsters are in a lot of things. They have they have their their original superheroes fought giant monsters. There's giant robots to fight giant monsters. So what do you mean, me, me, something new? Do you just want no more Godzilla? Do you want a different kind of giant monster? We let, can go Cthulhu. Let Godzilla be Godzilla, but yeah, just do something new. Like a new like giant monster kind of thing. Like Make something up. 
why I love craft is in public domain. So Cthulhu's up for grabs. I'm just saying. That's why go. South Park could have a Cartman flying around with him, which was amazing. <laughs> which was amazing. That was the most random ass episode. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so if you like South Park, you might love the fact that Monarch is renewed for season two <laughs> by Apple's TV+. Plus. So uh, just another bit of news. You know the eclipse last week? Yeah? I'm yeah. asking you a question. You yeah. know the eclipse last week? Did you, t- did you turn into a superhero? Uh, not that I am aware of. I don't think so. You didn't get powers? None that I've discovered. Well, you know what they did in 2005 when they had the show Heroes, which originally came out and lasted four seasons and then was later uh, had kind of a sequel series that lasted one season called Heroes Reborn. You know, uh, Zachary Quintos from, you know, Spock from the new Star Trek. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was he was Siler. He was the the crazy guy that could cut people's brains open with his mind. Yeah. Save the cheerleaders, save the world. That was a good series. We've talked about it a couple times on the podcast. Which is serendipitous because this is new news. Apparently, they are going to, uh, it says it's going to be like a reboot of the show. I don't know if that means the last show happened and this is in the same universe or if we're just going to start it over. But the original creator, Tim Craig, is involved. So, you know, it's exciting news if you're a fan of that show. It kind of, I think it fell off like a lot of people season one was obviously the best season two because the writer strike got killed season three i liked half of it i liked the latter half the first half not so much the second half yes and then season four was pretty good just okay yeah well hopefully they see something a little better here maybe he's got some new ideas oh man you know what's other it's also serendipitous is how we keep bringing up star trek this episode because our next bit of news is star trek related again So, do you know the animated show Star Trek Lower Decks? I do not. Uh, It's fun. It's a a sci-fi comedy. It is kind of like Rick and Morty animation, and it it was... Okay, I have seen clips of something like that. Yeah, yeah, it keeps canon in the Star Trek world. Like, it absolutely happens, but it it takes, like, a fun tongue-in-cheek without breaking... It doesn't break the universe, you know what I mean? They, They don't cross the line, but it's good. If you're a Star Trek fan, most people have accepted it. Some people are still holdouts because they're like, this isn't Star Trek. Anyways, it's been pretty popular, and it has a season five coming up, and it is the last. They're they're ending it. It's not canceled. They're going to, like, have the show come to a close. That's good. Yeah, it says, yeah, it will conclude with season five. So, yeah, look forward to that. That's good if you guys are a part of into that. I haven't watched it myself, but yeah, from the clips I've seen, it looks cool. I like it. It's a fun adult cartoon, which isn't, like, too adult. Like, you could watch it with your uh, older kids, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, high school, maybe middle school, depending on maturity level. I mean, besides, like, a, a small sex joke here or there, it's pretty tame. I mean, if you're if we're comparing it to, like, Family Guy and South Park, this is, this is more Simpsons. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But uh, I enjoyed that a lot. And uh, by the way, just in a little bit of Star Trek news, also the show that is out right now with Pike, it's called Star Trek Brave New Worlds. I say Pike because it's Captain Pike. It, he is the uh, the guy before Kirk. Anyways, that has been renewed for season four as well. <coughs> All right, guys. Nito. Yeah. And then this, the mo- what is some of the most exciting news next to Ninja Turtles this week is Shadow the Hedgehog. Is, it was teased at the end of the Sonic the Hedgehog movie. And we've all been wondering, who will play Shadow the Hedgehog? A lot of people believed it was going to be Hayden Christensen. Hmm. You know, the Canadian man who was Darth Vader. You know that character, yeah. Ryan? That, yeah. that gentleman who hates sand? Yes, I do know that gentleman very well. Well, wrong! He is not Damn. the person who will be playing Shadow the Hedgehog in Sonic the Hedgehog 3 is Keanu Reeves. No, why? Yeah, dude, I like Keanu Reeves. And I like it when he voices stuff. Do you know uh, he did, he was in, what is it, Toy Story 4? Yep, he was uh, the Canadian... Nukem Kaboom or yeah, something like yeah. that. <laughs> uh, and he just popped up. I know he popped up in a SpongeBob movie. He just popped up and he's like, hi, I'm Keanu Reeves. And he was he was even in video games, man. There was yeah. the Cyberpunk 2077 or whatever. He was your weird AI guy that you kept seeing. And people made mods so you could have sex with him. And it was actually brought to his attention on a talk show, and he thought it was awesome. Well, <laughs> if you're going to be objectified, that is such a fun way to be objectified. Like, could you imagine? Like, <laughs> Can I imagine what? Having sex with Keanu Reeves? Is, it, Not particularly. You know, I, do, I, okay. I can imagine, let me tell you, <laughs> having someone be able to virtually have sex with me. That would be That might be awkward, actually. Once again, back to the visiting of porn star at the convention. <laughs> you're like... 
Here, will you sign this picture? I just think you give the best blowjobs on camera. Yeah, okay, like, that's creepy. How could you not be creeped out by your fans? Got to have, like, rubber gloves on as you're signing everything. Like, <laughs> my God, oh, everything's rough. sticky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, I don't know how I got into that tangent. So Keanu Reeves <laughs> going to be, be Shadow. Shadow the Hedgehog. I'm <laughs> excited because we also have Jim Carrey back. I was going to say, Jim Carrey does such a good job in that. Like, th- those movies are way better than they should have been. Thank goodness they the studio listened to the internet and fix Sonic because I have a feeling if they didn't, we probably wouldn't have seen a two or definitely not this one. No, if the looks could have killed this franchise. and But I want to bring back to Jim Carrey real quick. Rumor has it that he gets fat in this one. So he's slowly turning into like what Robotnik would look like. Oh, they could just, yeah, fit him with a fat suit. It'll work. <clears throat> I, I just think that's funny. I think so, too. That's great. He's definitely got the mustache and, like, the face, the look down. He's amazing. <laughs> well, guys, we only have one little bit of uh, news left, and that's The Rookie, which is a cop show. It's on ABC. It's uh, going to be renewed for season seven, which is, I mean, cop shows usually do last a long time if they're popular, but still, any show that gets to season seven, you got to respect. That stars Nathan Fillion. And he, of course, was Mel Reynolds in Firefly with the early 2000s show, which I'm a huge fan of. It's actually part of why this is news, because I don't normally watch cop shows. But my wife likes this one, (laughs) and we're a fan of Nathan Fillion, so good for you. It's a pretty good show. If you like cop shows, it's a pretty good show. I will say the earlier seasons were a bit like more, oh, my God, who's going to die? Anyone can die. This is dramatic. And the newer seasons are a little bit like, everybody's always safe. But, you know, beyond that, it's pretty good. I like it. Yeah, I, I got nothing on this, but uh, good for them. Like you said, you reach se- season seven. That's that's one hell of an accomplishment. One hell of an accomplishment. Remember that guy? Remember that gal? Well, now they're dead. All right. So, guys, it looks like O.J. Simpson has died, and he was 76 and there's not much more to say about that. O.J. Simpson, of course, is very famous for his role in the Naked Gun series. <laughs> and, of course, <laughs> the most famous trial, like, probably of our time, right? Like, that was huge. I mean, I do remember when we were in grade school, they said they would ring the bell once if he was uh, guilty and twice if he was acquitted. And, like, they rang twice and everyone was just happy and cheering, which is uh, really screwed up in hindsight because... This was grade school, so we didn't. None of us were following the trial. Yeah, Why was, were we all just like, "Yay, he's found not guilty"? Were we just like, "Wow, well, he's not guilty, so clearly he didn't do it." Like the courts, they know it. They, you know, clearly we're fine. It's I, it's crazy how much it really did bring the country together. It's bring cr- the country together. Is well, like every this well, wasn't like the the little girl get lost in the well, man. This was a murder trial. But what I mean is that, like, literally, like I heard people saying that to this day they tell their their like grandmother, like, "Oh, OJ died. Good, he killed so and so." Like people like still hold that grudge like for a long time. Like it, a lot well, of people it, feel certain ways a lot about of it. Pe- well, you know, we're not going to get into the whole drama of the situation, but if you feel as though someone is guilty of murder and you feel as though they weren't punished for it, yeah, man, that's that doesn't go away. You know, people are still angry. I want to say the joke that I read online. <laughs> go ahead, go it ahead. Like, it was like in a people were taking Norm Macdonald esque kind of style joking when when he died because famously during the trial, Norm Macdonald was the dude behind the news desk at Saturday Night Live. Yeah, that makes sense. So he got to do weekend, all the jokes. He was Weekend Update. That was it. Thank you. Weekend Update. He And uh, he killed it during that time. He was the perfect. Thank God he was in it. But I saw one where it was like, OJ Simpson can now rest easy knowing that the killer of his wife is finally dead. Oh. And there was another one. Uh, OJ's family said that they were glad that he died doing what he loved, getting away with murder. <laughs> I miss or I miss Norm Macdonald. Me too. Anyways, OJ died at uh, 76. And then on a sadder note, well, I think it's sadder. Uh, Eleanor Coppola, which was the wife of Francis Ford Coppola. She was, of course, famous in her own right. But, you know, she died at 87. And that's it's really sad. Francis Ford Coppola basically sold part of his vineyard recently to make a new film. I think it's Metal- Megalopolis, I believe. And uh, that's going to be coming out soon. It has a huge star, a bunch of 
you know, guests, a lot of people. But he sells half his vineyard. He's putting everything he has into it. And he hasn't made a movie. He made The Godfather, of course, but he hasn't made a movie in a really long time. So it's like, is this going to be a flop or not? But now his wife is dead. And it's just like, oh, man, this is a passion project. And you just lost your wife. I just want this to be a win for you. And it's really sad because, uh, you know, anybody who's happily married, you, you'd you understand that you'd be pretty lost without the person you're married to. So very sad. You know, most people die pretty shortly after their after their um, spouses. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think Stan Lee, it was like a year mm. after his wife died. Yeah. Well, anyways, Eleanor Coppola died at 87. It's, you know, good long life and uh, she will be missed. She will. No, I hope he sees success with this film because he's earned it. Aha, and now we're finally here. Our Fallout discussion. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. All right, guys. So Fallout is a series now on Amazon Prime. It is eight episodes, and it takes place firmly canon, canon, 100% canon in the Fallout universe. That, of course, can change, but as far as I know, that is what they are saying. The uh, the producers, the writers, they said that this almost could be considered a Fallout 5. It's funny, because they were just doing a tongue-in-cheek remark to be like, hey, this is in the universe, and all the fanboys went crazy, and they're like, what? We're not going to get a Fallout 5 because we have a show? And they're like, no, 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 we're, got, we're saying this story takes place after all the others, and it could be considered a Fallout 5. Relax. Right. It, they're still going to do the game five. This is just in that time. Exactly. So this is a spoiler talk. We're just going to talk about everything. We're going to jump around the series. And uh, yeah, so just if you haven't seen the show and you don't want anything spoiled, then yeah, I guess you're done with the episode. Goodbye. We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. <laughs> but for those of us who want to talk, let's talk. What did they get right? What did they get wrong? Ryan, tell us about what you liked about the first episode. So, yeah, I got to watch the first episode. Uh, I loved it. You get to see the humor because there's a certain humor to, like, the naivety of these, you know, vault dwellers. Vault 33, I believe, is what they were. Yeah, so a lot of the vaults were, basically, the vaults are all communities created before a great nuclear war. And a lot of these were terrible experience, but some of them were controlled vaults where they tried to make some kind of utopia. And that, Vault 33, is the kind of vault we're in. So everyone is very leave it to beaver and happy go lucky. So, yeah, so you would assume that she was probably born and raised there. You know, and the main for, character. Yeah, for probably a couple few generations because everybody's pretty stuck in there and they're really stuck in their ways don't open the vault door they do a real cool thing where they marry her off or whatever to like a, a neighboring vault because this is just the way that they do they kind of betroth each other yeah so what ryan's talking about is our main character is named lucy and she is a vault dweller now to stop them from interbreeding and having for lack of a better word a you know birth defects they are sharing some they, they swap people between vaults. There are three vaults connected, Vault 31, Vault 32, and Vault 33. So Lucy <coughs> petitions the leaders to get basically married and have someone from Vault 32 come in and marry her so there's new blood. And one of our characters sneaks into Vault 32 because he senses that something isn't right. So she has her wedding night with this with this guy that she thinks is from Vault, Vault 32. 32. Yeah. Our other character from Vault 33 has snuck into Vault 32 with no one noticing. And the sees... other character he's talking about is named Norm. Norm is Lucy, our main character's brother. So he sneaks in and sees all the plants are dead. There's no harvest. There's corpses. The place has obviously been raided by raiders. Something is awry in Vault 32. So she figures it out when she sees a giant scar going down his entire side of her lover's side, whips on her pit boy points it at him, sees he's irradiated, knows that he's an outsider. A pit boy is a computer that all vault dwellers have on their wrists. It's a very common game, uh, a game thing. It's, you know, in the video game, you have to use that to find your inventory and to show the map. So it's funny that they, it's great that they include it in the show because it actually is something that the character wears. It's like your start menu on the game. Exactly. So very fun. And 
So she gets into it with him. She proves that she's not a pushover because in the beginning. No, it was a yeah. harsh fight. Yeah. So she kicks his ass. She's a badass. Uh, he does get her, get, does stab her, but she wins the fight. Uh, there's a huge battle ensues between the Raiders and all of the Vault Dwellers. It's pretty brutal. This, this series definitely is pretty brutal. I love it. It is pretty bloody. So these these uh, Raiders from the outside have gotten into the Vault, and what they do is they end up stealing the head of the Vault, the leader, yeah. which is Lucy's father. So the woman in charge of the Raiders basically alludes to Lucy that, I knew your mother, and there's more to this than you realize. <laughs> she takes her father and blows up the entrance to Vault 32. So now Vault 31 is, uh, excuse me, Vault 33 is completely blocked off from the other bomb shelter, Vault 32. So Lucy decides, with the help of her brother and her cousin, which apparently she was fooling around with, there's a little throwaway joke of, I have to marry someone outside the vault. It's okay to fool around with your cousin, but you can't marry him. Yeah, that's what, that was part of that humor, that really naive way of life, that really like innocent, innocent weird vault life that all these, it, they captured it perfectly. Absolutely, very much from the game. Well, anyways, that is her cousin Chet and her brother, and they help her escape the vault. And now she is out in the wasteland. This is 200 years after a nuclear war, and that is the setup for Lucy, our whole show. We also follow a character named Maximus, who yep. is in the Brotherhood of Steel. And that was a cool, yeah, that was a cool, like, segue story about him. Well, uh, we follow three characters, because yeah. we also follow the ghoul. Yes. Which is uh, Walter Goggins. The he, the ghoul is who he plays. And these three characters go through the whole series. And I can already tell that, you know, I'm I'm in it for this. Like, I, I only got to see the first episode. So, so I we, saw it all. So we I saw see, the whole thing. So we see him kind of go through it. He doesn't make the cut to become a knight of the Brotherhood. Someone ends up uh, putting, like, blades in the boots of one of the other guys who did. So, obviously, he now can't be one. They interrogate him. It was a really cool scene. And All the suits of armor are amazing. Yeah, so Maximus is now going to be a squire, I believe they call it. But basically, he's helping out one of the knights. Eventually, that knight dies. He gets his suit of armor, and he is now posing as a full-fledged knight of the Brotherhood of Steel, which he will be killed for. So how does he get out of this? Well, he has to find the target. Everyone is after the target. The target is a gentleman with glasses, and he has a dog, and he is from the Enclave. Which I figured he was from the Enclave, yeah. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know, in the game lore, the Enclave is the remnants of the U.S. government that has formed after the nuclear war that once again was 200 years ago. And this man steals proprietary information from the Enclave and escapes. He knows everything about uh, vault Tech and Lucy, when they meet, he just talks to Lucy very frankly and explains pretty much, you know, who she is, what her vault's crop is, why that it's a control vault, all this stuff, uh, and is coaxed into basically saying, take me to this warlord. Now, the vault dweller, Lucy, says, I can't take you to this warlord. I have to find my dad. That is my whole, my whole thing. And he's like, okay, well, this warlord is the woman who took your dad. And she's like, oh, okay, great. And through a series of events, now she is escorting this man. But he is the target that the Brotherhood of Steel is after. He is also the target that the ghoul is after. A bounty has gone out because this proprietary information that this man stole from the Enclave could change the power structure of the Wasteland. And we follow these three, character these three characters throughout the show. There's a bit of a romance that shows up between Lucy and uh, Maximus. The ghoul, is he good guy? Is he bad guy? Is It's just, it's a lot of fun. It, the whole show is amazing. And I want you to know, Ryan, because I don't want to spoil too much for you, but it ends with a gentleman, our main character, who ends up being an antagonist. Big spoiler, I don't want to give it away, even though I should. You can, go ahead. All right, so when she, Lucy, towards the end, finally gets to the warlord she finds out that her dad is actually a 200 years old and was in crisis in vault 31 it's all stasis people from vault tech it's all actual employees and things like that and he is part of the evil people essentially because the what is revealed in this show is 
who dropped the bombs in Fallout? Who did the Great War? Well, they make you think that it's the commies, the Reds versus America, but it turns out Vault Tech is a company, and Vault Tech makes money by selling vaults. And there was peace negotiations, and they needed to make sure that people were afraid because if they weren't buying vaults, then they weren't making money. And it turns out that Vault Tech is, in fact, the ones who dropped the first bombs. The nuclear mm. war was Vault Tech. And uh, the people who made that decision, turns out Lucy's dad is one of them. So the warlord says, your mom was killed because she found this out when she tried to escape and your dad nuked uh, Shady Pines. Did you hear that? Shady Pines. Shady Pines was a main uh, location in the first and second Fallout game. It is where the California New Republic formed and was the capital of the California New Republic before it apparently was destroyed about 20 years before our Fallout series by Lucy's father. And the last, uh, she he gets away, the ghoul and her are after him, the proprietary information ends up being falling into the hands of the Brotherhood of Steel, so now they have the ultimate power, which, by the way, ends up being Cold Fusion. So the season ends where L.A. is being lit up because... Cold Fusion has been activated. Lucy finds out the truth that her dad killed her mom and is basically Vault Tech and an evil son of a bitch. He goes running off in a power armor suit. The ghoul is after him because he wants to know where his family is because I didn't mention any of this. But the ghoul's family, his wife mainly, was a big wig in Vault Tech too. And he was coaxed into being a Vault Tech spokesperson when he was in a big Hollywood actor back in the day. Uh, not realizing that they're as evil of a company as they are. So he reveals his motivation when he says, where the fuck is my family? And so he's now after Lucy's father. Lucy's after her father. They ch they follow him across the wasteland, and it ends where we see him heading towards New Vegas. Nice. Nice, right? Nice. My yeah. favorite. And there's so much more in the show. They come across a vault of mutants, and you think it's bad, and they end up being good. Uh, there's not a lot of the, the creatures from the game that I liked. Like, there's not, there's no murlocs, there's no mole rats, there's no huh. death claws. We do get a death claw skull, and we do get a, one of the robots uh, laying in the desert. But they, they, they didn't have a lot of the creatures. They focused on a lot of the human drama. There was some mutants in it. Don't misunderstand. The we sets, got the, the sets were perfect. The sets, sets were great. beautiful. Yeah, the, the the vault door, all the yellow railings and everything leading to it. It was right from the game. Every they did it perfect. They look so much like the game, uh, and they they had the, everything is supposedly canon. So they explained, um, which I guess is a little bit of a retcon, but why the pit boy gives a thumbs up. Yep, because he's looking at the cloud. Yeah, and apparently if the cl if you put out your thumb and there's a big nuclear bomb and the cloud is smaller than your finger, then you run for the hills. If it's bigger than your finger, well, then don't bother running. Yeah, and I, uh, I just I really liked it. I'm excited to I'm gonna watch the rest of it now. It I don't mind that I got quote unquote spoiled or whatever because it's Be still fun to watch. And I know there's so many like they had the stim pack. You know, like from it, they so much a, from the game. They, they have, they have rads. Cool. They have the, 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 the rad away, the radiation yep. stuff. Yep. And I heard that uh, Mr. Handy is gonna <laughs> be involved in this. Too. He I is. Saw he's got some good scenes, and he is, dude. It's straight out of the game. That's awesome. He even he sounds like Mr. Handy, which is funny because the there's a character from what we do in the shadows. He was also the boss in It Crowd. I do not remember his name. He was also in season. I think six of community as the grifter teacher. But anyways, he plays that robot. And then he also plays himself in a cut scene that takes place before the great war. Cause he's friends with the Walter Giggins character, the ghoul, uh, because they're both actors. And he talks about, I lent my voice to that fucking machine. And now it greets me every time I go into the store. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm excited for the rest of it. I'm into it. I think they did a great job. It's being called one of the best uh, video game adaptations, which is really why we're talking about it, because most video game adaptations are not considered very good. And this one, this one knocked it out of the park. 
Well, you know what, guys? Uh, sorry to cut it a little bit short, but we're running long today. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for listening to Earthling Entertainment. If you like our show, this is what we do. We do the spooky, the creepy, we do the aliens, then we do some entertainment news. Uh, there's a lot of interruptions, a lot of movie references, <laughs> and a lot of fun. And if you want to support us, please download the episodes. And thanks for listening. Do you got anything else to say, Ryan? Uh, if you want to message us, Facebook Messenger is the best way. If you got anything you want us to talk about or if you have any questions or comments or concerns, just go ahead and send it there. And we'll get back to you as soon as we can. And thank you very much for listening, guys. Yes, yeah, so all of us here from Earthling Entertainment. See ya. See ya. <laughs>